we need to find bigger pool of players. Uh, so one of the challenges in coaching probably is there's uh, squash courts are not easily accessible. We'll share just the advice that my dad gave me when I was young, you know, where every time there's a sports match coming on, he said, just watch, watch these professionals play, it's the same for any sport, and listen to the commentators, because commentators are ex-professionals, and this is how we learn. Um, let's say old, young, you know, we want everyone, because if you take older players, yes. then their kids might join. What is up guys? My name is Charles Neal. Welcome to Beast Chat with Charles Neal Season 2. And we're still talking to real business people, in a way, about real business stuff. But hey, why so serious? In this episode, we talk to Andre Kaur, the head coach of Sarawak and Squash. Okay? Now, here's the thing. As you guys know, after watching all of our episodes, that business don't happen in isolation. And in this season, you will know that we're looking into various industries in Sarawak and how we can make each industry self-sustainable and thriving, okay? And I think Andre, being a personal friend, I think it would be very easy to talk to the head coach of Sarawak and Squash and see what he thinks about the state of sport in the country and in Sarawak in general. If you look at all of the sports centres, recreation centres, they're always booked out. Because we are, sport is so much a part of our culture, right? But why is sport always just recreational for us and never truly competitive? Why is that? I think first we have to define what's uh, competitive, right? So probably they would need to be winning at the highest level over and over and over again, you know? So in Sarawak and in Malaysia, we have top athletes which win once, twice, but to sustain like maybe Nicole David, Lee Chong Wei, you know, so they have to be groomed really well. They have to be disciplined. They have to have that hunger and passion. I was an ex, ex uh, junior player, but then after that, I did not have that, probably I did not have that hunger enough to, to take it to the next level. Is it on you to have the hunger or would the ecosystem actually play a part in that? Uh, I think it's a little bit of both. Probably if the ecosystem was more finessed, uh, as it is now, it's, I mean, it's getting better uh, year by year. Uh, maybe that would then influence some of my decisions. You know, like a majority, I think we look into mon money. Um, is sports a career, you know? Um, after, after SPM, like, should I study or should I continue to play? You know, can I have a good career with sports? And then after that, we need to look into, if we want to go for tournaments, we will need to fund our travels. And if we don't go, if we don't go for tournaments, we don't get points. When you say fund your travels, means what? Like the government don't 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 really sponsor you for for these trips. Uh, so the government does have some money money yes. to go for this, but how much? You know, yes. so then it's up to us as uh, athletes to pick which tournaments we want to go to. So it's not just as easy as um, I want to play. Yeah. So real um, elite athletes as well. We have to be a bit smart with our. Yeah decision we pick which tournaments that we can take as far because initially we want to get ranking take me through the journey of a budding athlete like say for example if you know if there's a kid six years old seven years old um identified to have you know you know the, the talent in maybe football or in squash or in badminton what's next for this kid i mean let's use the long-term athlete athlete development, yeah. you know, where they they say when you're young, you need to have multiple sports. Yeah. Don't don't go early specialize. You know, then when you get older, you can decide which sport sure. you want to play. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's the normal way to go. But for us, let's just use squash. Let's say they come in. Initially, we'll take them training just for the basics, once, twice a week. Yeah. And on the occasions that we see those that, you know, have talent, of course, then we cannot, we cannot show biasness. <laughs> So we will then have to try to keep them. Sure. And then we will slowly uh, talk to the parents. Then we're going to increase their training load to maybe three times a week. You know, you have to do it slowly because if you do it too fast, one parents, you know, in, in Sarawak especially is tuition, tuition, tuition. Yes. So we need to slowly bring that in. The good thing is that our junior development program here, it's pretty good. We have lots of tournaments. 
So local tournaments, local um, semenanjung. So you can go up to seven, eight tournaments a year. This is squash we're talking about. Just yeah? squash, yeah. I think that I think that's why squash in Malaysia is actually not too bad. Sure. Yeah, we are quite. We're very good on junior level. We're top top three in the world actually. So when they come in, we can decide which tournaments they go from exposure tournaments just for fun sure. to all the way to competitive ones. From your experience um, developing young talents, uh, uh, um, are there success stories? Like for us, we all have our uh, different goals and all this thing. And we, 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 we even have a different definition of what success looks like. Right. Yeah, that's very true actually because some, some people just, you know, just to get, we're too result orientated sometimes I would, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a that's a really good what you mentioned. Yeah, so success stories. Um, as of now, I think uh, we're talking about Sarawak. Yeah. Miri has been producing a lot of um, good 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 players. How how they work? And just imagine this. Um, let's say you suddenly have one really good athlete. So then this this athlete becomes a role model. So then you know it's it's more of like all the all his peers would then have someone to strive to be uh, and all sure, that and sure, they train sure, together sure. so i think that plays a small part on it it's it's a very small part but we need to find bigger pool of players uh so one of the challenges in coaching probably is there's uh, squash courts are not easily accessible and like now we're lucky we have a squash court at the uh, stadium petrajaya yeah. yeah but then some people still find it's too far you know people around town area How's how's the grassroots like um, for squash? Like, like as as the head coach of um, Sarawak squash, for example, do you have access to like say for example all of the squash clubs um, in in high schools in primary schools? Like like are there um, reach in into these clubs? So I used to do this before I was the head coach. Yeah. So so <laughs> initially, like yeah, you know, like after the playing career, yeah. that's that's one there, right? Um. So after I finish squash. 17 i stopped i stopped playing so i did two things um one to either go to bukit jalo and try to turn pro i was invited career progression do, do i want that uh would it you know let's say if i'm injured what happens then is there you know is there any support after that or if i, I give so much time and i get injured and this was let's say almost 10 years ago do you have that hunger to to sacrifice four or five hours a day you know, and not eat kolomi, not eat laksa. So that's something I could never do. Sure. sure. You know, I, I train hard, but, you know, diet, you know, I like to eat. You can yeah. see my slides. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know? Okay. Yeah, so, so, so that's one of the reasons why I was away from the scene for, let's say, two years. Okay. Because mm, um, play too much, burnout, you know, when, you, when you're training, let's say, six, seven times a, a week. Yeah. So you go to university and that's how you experience a whole new world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, so I just stayed away for a while, did some part-time coaching, get some money, you know. And then um, my late coach, he passed away. And then, yeah, so he passed away around that time. And then squash and coaching, the players were dwindling, probably because he's getting old, his health and all this. So then we came back, a few of us, the ex-players came back and yeah. then decided to okay uh you know i may not be passionate to be a champion but yeah. squash has been part of my life for i don't know i played since i was seven yeah yeah so yeah. now i'm 31 whoa it's 20, <laughs> 20 over yeah, years yeah, in the yeah, squash yeah, yeah. so yeah so going in there then how do we then create more players yeah. again taking into account squash is not so popular sure. so we can't just if we just put ads, come and play squash, nobody will come you know so, and then we went to the school so and we do the eca sure I think initially you just want to make squash fun, make squash a more volume, more popular sport. From the conversation that that that, that we just had, right? Um, I want to highlight the fact that it is so hard to get a sport going um, if it's purely from individual efforts. I would say, I'm not saying the government is do everything. I think. It's the ecosystem that is not not ready locally, and if people are waiting for each other to start something, then everyone is just playing a waiting game without someone leading the way and creating a revival within that sport alone. So we'll go to a break. When we come back, we'll talk to Andre about um, sports as a full time career. I think that is a fascinating one. So we'll be right back. <laughs> And 
we're back to Beast Chat with Charles Liu Season 2. And we're still with Andre Cole, the head coach of Sarawak and Squash. Sports as a full-time career. Now, is it possible in Sarawak, in Malaysia? It is possible to a certain extent. Um, okay. It depends on what we're trying to achieve and all that. Um, sports as a career, firstly, I think this is quite interesting though. Let's, let's not look into sports as just sports but sports is a billion dollar industry right oh yeah yeah so oh, yeah. so a lot of people don't look into what's that uh endorsements sponsorships and and yeah. all these things so sports as a full-time career could be possible um there are two things let's look into one uh something i always emphasize um from grooming kids from young and this is like look into those top athletes like uh roger federer lewis hamilton yes. And those football players, right? After they finish and they go for press conferences yes. and the way they carry themselves are just another level compared to Malaysians. Yes. Uh, over the years, I think it, we're, we're getting there now. Yeah. We're going there now, but you know, we could start that earlier and this would then, you know, it doesn't have to be just sports. They can bring this to other things in the future, but if they are carry themselves well, and then they carry Malaysia Sarawak's name, and then this would then attract you know, it's easier to then attract sponsors and all these things, endorsements. So that's one of the possibilities. Over the past few years, as of now, like that, they're getting there. Um, the sports ministry, Sports Sarawa, Majlis Sukan Negeri, they have quite a good vision. Creating this um, Sarawa as a powerhouse, you know, we want to not only just be the next book at Jello, but even better. We don't need to go to KL to then have tournaments. I mean, to, to produce athletes and all these things. Okay. So, so Tell like, us more about the plan. Um, like, you know, like they're even bringing in the sports village. So we're going to have our own sports village here so we can retain the athletes. Sure. They What's are funding, the roadmap of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the roadmap. Uh, um, just as of now, uh, they're actually funding in Sarawak alone. They're funding s uh, coaches. Sure. So it's like we get more fixed salaries and all as compared to last time where we had to yeah. rely on sports. Uh, students to just give fees and all that which is sometimes not enough yeah. we do get a lot of help now from the government sure so going there and then the, the roadmap into having a sports village having a high performance unit life after professional sports is sarawak probably not sarawak maybe i'll give you a few people that i know around malaysia sure, sure. yeah so Majority still end up coaching. <laughs> you know, they they finish they finish their their playing careers. They are probably top thirty, top forty, maybe not top one, because Ong Beng Hee. Yeah, Ong Beng Hee top ten. But you know, you have to be back to the grooming and everything. You have to be top one, and you have to be charismatic yes. and a bit smarter in your decisions. Yes. And these are the people like the cool uh, yeah. Lee Chong Wei where they probably get really good career because they get endorsements, they get sponsorships. Yeah. But for the rest of us who do not get all the way to that level, you know, it's that cutthroat. Like, after you're done, then then what? I I agree with you 100%. I think um, because, like I shared with you er earlier about some of the ex-professional football players that, that I personally know and sitting down with them to talk about um, what are they doing now? Um, how are they coping now? You can feel like there is a roadblock here. Like for example, I, I can't name names, but one of the professional footballers that, 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 that I was having a meeting with, wondering whether he should go for a footballing coaching license or whether he should just be working for the small company that he's working with and earning a bit of money and then playing football over the weekend and, and taking a bit of uh, money from each club that actually hires him for that particular weekend. I think it's sad because these were household names in their prime. They used to represent Malaysia. They used to represent Sarawak. But when everything is over, um, they're left to fend for themselves. Should the government then be teaching, like if someone decide to actually go pro, okay? Um, so basically going pro basically at the age of 15, 16 or whatever, and so perhaps not going to university, or maybe if they go to university, because they will need to train along the way, they may, they may not have excelled in university and things like that. So once the career is done in sports, would there be 
would, well, should there be um, coaching as to how you actually adapt into working life and how do you succeed thereafter? It's quite tough though, because if we, again, we should not look at coaching as the worst case scenario because <laughs> coaches are, I mean, it's only in Malaysia, but let's say in other countries, maybe coaches are paid pretty well, oh, yeah, yeah. you know? So, so I think it's overall, it's a whole big picture thing that, it, you know, which do we start first and all that. Yeah, and we would still need coaches, which, because they're specialized, uh, expertise is definitely needed. For the government to actually coach them to get oh, back yes. into the workforce and, 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 and to monetize whatever skills they have for the rest of their lives, you know what I mean? Yeah, probably we would need some courses on that as oh, well, yeah, right? Yeah. You know, in that sense, yeah. Okay, okay. So guys, we'll go to a break and when we come back, we will wrap things up uh, with um, Andre's prediction as to how sports will develop in Sarawak going forward. We'll be right back. <laughs> Back to Beast Chat with Charles Liu, Season 2, final segment with Andre Kaur, the head coach of Sarawak and Squash. Now, what would you like to see happen in Sarawak and sports? I would say it's, it's getting there, but I probably want to improve the structure on in terms of that cycle from grassroots level all the way back up to coaches. And, you know, that cycle, grassroots, professional, all that. So starting in schools, you know, instead of like us keep going to do talent ID to beg for players. Um, take for example, uh, just our neighbors, Singapore, you know, they have school programs and then they, from these school programs, then it's easy to then create inter school tournaments, you know, inter house, inter school. Uh, and then from there grading system, you know, it's, it's more structured and then yes. this would then eliminate any, um, biasness, any, What's that? We have a proper roadmap. Yep. And this would then be more attractive to more people coming in. Yes. Because, yes. Um, like for squash, we do not have Olympics. That's sad. But over here, uh, my ex teammates and all that, we actually use squash as a stepping stone to go for a sports scholarship in, sure. in uh, USA. Mm -hmm. Like, take for example, schools, it's everyone goes to school, you know? So so just, you know, I'm, I'm sure, let's say someone sponsors a. Uh, into school tournament yes. and yes. it's a yearly thing like you yes. mentioned as well yes you know? so yes. this is huge brand exposure absolutely i know that absolutely yeah. brilliant now what are the challenges that you think are impeding the development of sports in sarawak uh, the main one is just we can't retain athletes why our general lifespan for athletes here is all the way to sukma or spm and then they're gone they go study sure sure <laughs> yeah. They either go study or they go work. and So the major impediment, would you say, is mindset? Yeah, mindset is there. Parents, I mean, I was invited to go to Bukit Jalil yeah. and when I was 13. Yeah, and then my, my dad was like, no lah, stay here, train here. Any so, regrets? Uh, there are some what ifs, like even after 17, whether I wanted to, to turn pro, if I could go there or not, or go to the States, follow my teammates. Yeah. You know? I actually skipped my SATs because I just decided I didn't want to play squash anymore. Sure. Yeah, so regrets, I don't think so. I cause I, I don't, I'm not that kind of person that wants to think of what ifs. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But okay. yeah, it would be good to try to play at that competitive level once in a while. Now when I see the professionals play, I do miss it sometimes, yeah. Sure, <laughs> okay, okay. Um, what is your advice to young athletes um, wanting to turn pro or semi-pro? For athletes as well, I think it's all about time management. You know, you, you can't just study all the time, you know, it's just do, you, you definitely need to study. So you have to backup plan. Yeah. Uh, again, sports is cutthroat, but I don't think it's hard to spend two, three hours a day playing a sport that you love, you know? Uh, and now it's so much better with like YouTube and broadcasting where you can actually watch, take for example, oh, squash yeah. now. Oh, you can, yeah. I can watch full life matches on YouTube oh, for yeah. free and there was not, none last time. Yeah. Uh, I will share just the advice that my dad gave me when I was young, you know, where every time there's a sports match coming on, he said, just watch 
watch these professionals play, same for any sport, and listen to the commentators, because commentators are ex-professionals, and this is how we learn from listening to uh, different people, you know, learning from the top. Yeah, so it's so free, it's so easy yes. right now. So that, that's, I think, the best advice I can give. Sure, sure. For fear of sports like squash being phased out, right, going forward, like, you know, what, what can be done here? Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why I still stick to squash because I love the sport. Can't, I can't just leave the sport. It's really yeah. hard. Um, so what I do now when people want to play, um, squash is so hard to find public courts. Uh, old, young, you know, we want everyone because if you take older players, yes. then their kids might join. So we can't just say, um, I just want to find younger players. I think that's a mentality where some of the people have. Yes. And that's not good as well, sure. you know, because older people are where money comes. So we need money to sustain. I mean, <laughs> that's it's, it's true, you know? That's fair. Because if, if there's no money coming in, yeah. then they are not going to bring their kids yes. to come and play. So, so, so there's something that individually as coaches or as someone part of the sport, yes. that we would then just have to keep trying to, to do better. So. So when they come to play, what I do sometimes is, um, okay, I'll give you five lessons or 10 lessons. Yeah. I, I can't take them for a long term yes. because let's say they're older. I don't yes. have to, we are a limited time. Then after they come in, we just teach them the basics. Yeah. And then from there, we throw them to the pool of other people that I teach to try and create that community. Sure. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's what we try to create. And then if we have a huge enough community, yeah. And then tournaments can come in and this is where opportunities lie where we can get more more funding yeah. and more people to join aboard so i think that's the way moving forwards she has something for us to think about right at the end of the day a lot of the conversation we talk about yes we we, we talk about the things that we can do and things like that but at the end of the day it always comes up to funding right what could you do what could we do at the end of the day this is a beast chat program and the truth is this there are so many opportunities for you and I to actually leverage on sports. I mean, for, for sure, if sport is mature, there will be opportunities. But sports being not mature, sports being still in the development space, there are also opportunities because it's a blue ocean. You That's know what true. I mean? Yeah. So from my point of view, sports in the country, there's a lot to be desired. No doubt about it. Right. I mean, we look at all of the issues with Li Zizia and BAM and a lot of these kind of issues. At the end of the day, it's up to you and I. It's up to, up to our mentality, our kids. We decide for them sometimes. And so we ought to be making the right decisions as, as well. <laughs> so until the next episode, guys, we thank you, Andre Kaur, for coming on the show. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you guys in the next episode. Bye-bye.